Hey everybody, it's Jason with Parallel Reality back with you here today to go over a misconception that we're seeing quite a bit from people on the left uh, and some people who are probably heading towards the center as well. Um, and then you can see that title of the article here. It's from The Federalist uh, from March 29th. It says, there are no banned books. Now, I have not read this article yet. I just thought I wanted to jump into this because I felt like uh, whatever is about to happen here is uh, in this article is probably going to be close to the truth, if not the absolute God's honest truth. And I have no reason to think the Federalist is lying about this. So let's just dive right into it. Ooh, picture of books. Nice. Subheading says books are banned in Tennessee in as much the same way a person sent, can't say the word gay in Florida. It's a myth. All right. So what does the article say? It says, while checking out the banned and challenged display at my local Barnes & Noble recently, I was reminded that the entire kerfuffle is a giant racket. For publishers and booksellers, banned books are likely a money-making racket. Virtually every alleged banned book on the display table is already a massive, sometimes generational, bestseller. Not that this reality stops authors like Jody is it Picolt? whose books dot virtually every bookstore in the country from running around pretending their novels are banned because a sliver of taxpayers are no longer on the hook to buy them. And then a couple of tweets uh, from the author of the article here, and that was his picture at the very beginning. It says, For the left, the banned book claim is a political racket, allowing them to feign indignation over the alleged authoritarianism of Republicans who don't want kids reading identitarian pseudo-histories or books depicting oral sex, rape, violence, or gender dysphoria in their books. I said the R word, and I'm not monetized yet, so probably shouldn't matter, but here we go. It says, yet major media now regularly contend as indisputable fact that book bans are in place. The claim is embedded in the Democrats' daily rhetoric. After the mass shooting at Covenant School in Nashville, we were not plunged into another inane, oh, yeah, we were not plunged into another inane discussion about stochastic terrorism, which isn't a thing, or political violence, but rather a preposterous comparison of Tennessee's book bans and lax gun control. As Liz Cheney noted, if we really want to keep our children safe, we need to spend less time banning books and more time stopping the horrific gun violence in our schools. His books are banned in Tennessee in the same way a person can't say the word gay in Florida, like the subheadline. It's a myth. Said yet here in a recent headline from NPR, which might be on the list of worst sources, but I understand why he's doing it for this article, but NPR is in no way, shape, or form a trusted source. Said plot twist, activists skirt book bans with guerrilla giveaways and pop-up libraries. In the piece, the reader learns that with a record number of book bans on the horizon, some activists are finding creative ways to make banned books available to young readers anyway. It says, activists buying books at a local Barnes & Noble, where an endless supply exists, which is true, and handling them and handing them to other people's children against the wishes of parents isn't so much creative as it is creepy. That's true. NPR makes it sound as if these people were risking their lives trading Semizdat? Never heard of it. One step ahead of the secret police. Any dope with a car, a bus pass, a bicycle, legs, or an internet connection can hand some impressionable kid softcore P-word because there are no banned books. Now, if conservative activists set up pop-up libraries around the corner from schools and progressive districts handing out Huck Finn and books celebrating the Second Amendment or the superiority of traditional families, one imagines that NPR would find the guerrilla effort less charming. 100% true. They would not be a fan of that. There's one New York Times columnist. There's another crap source, the New York Times. Uh, one New York Times columnist argues that parents who vote for legislators that temper the cultural Marxist agenda in schools are engaging in a state-sanctioned heckler's veto. You guys look look in the mirror much? Anyway, so much for democracy, I guess. It is true that leftists who run virtually every major school district in the nation, I wouldn't say that's so anymore necessarily. I saw a lot of conservative victories, but I mean, maybe it's, well, this is virtually every major school district. Okay, so like all the ones with big cities with huge populations. Yeah, I guess that is right. I uh, don't need any laws or vetoes to dictate curriculums. But of course, most schools are run by the state, of course. How else are parents supposed to initiate change? Well, they aren't, right? That's the point. The contemporary left doesn't believe that parents have any say in which state-run school their children attend or what they are taught in them. Who's the authoritarian again? Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I, I don't understand that line of reasoning coming from people that parents can't have a say in what their kids are learning. Like, who the absolute hell do you think you are to tell a parent anything they can or cannot do with their children? Okay. <laughs> Knock it off. His teacher union types like to argue that parental rights bills are tantamount to telling a doctor how to operate on a patient. Okay. 
A more apt analogy is to say that Democrats want to force patients to undergo elective surgeries performed by untrained quacks. That's more accurate. Parental bills don't instruct teachers on methods. They only stop strangers from exposing kids to revisionist histories. Yep. And ideas about sexuality and ideologues that conflict with their beliefs. Or ideologies, I'm sorry. Then again, even if parents who don't want their prepubescent kids indoctrinated with these ideas are in the minority, why should they be forced to accept instruction or books that have nothing to do with genuine civics or well-rounded education? Yeah, I mean, when we got kids now learning the 1619 Project, which pretty much every historian imaginable on ev of every conceivable political uh, ideology came out and said that it was a bunch of bullshit, and it's still being passed along as if it's, like, actual history. Um, same thing with, oh, God, was it H that Howard Zinn book? I don't remember what it's called, but I've heard the name. Uh, I've seen it in, like, half price books. Uh, and I'm tempted to pick it up just to be like, what exactly does this thing say? Um, but I just don't really feel like wasting my time reading it. I've, you know, I read a lot of history books and I'd rather actually spend it reading the stuff I want to read about as opposed to hate reading something. So the article continues, says when the government restricts free association in the marketplace or giant tech companies are engaged in a concerted effort to censor ideas and news, we have a reason to worry about the state of free speech. When a heckler's veto that dominates universities makes it virtually impossible to have an open discourse on campuses, we have reason to worry. Correct. Book bans, however, are just curriculum choices leftists don't like. That's very true. It is certainly true that sometimes priggish moralists are overzealous in their targeting of books. That's true as well. Sometimes the bans are plain stupid, sometimes they are political, and sometimes they are initiated by left-wing administrations, as has been the case for years. But for the most part, book ban is just a euphemism for progressive administrators and teachers losing some of their power over your kids. That's a great statement. It says, while parents are compelled to live with the de devastating professional failures of a teacher union dominated monopoly that struggles to teach basic math, reading, writing, and science, there is no reason for them to accept political indoctrination as well. And that is the end of the article. So, yeah, I mean, that last sentence there is actually pretty telling. I mean, right now we have kids in, especially in inner cities, that can't even do any of this stuff right here math, reading, writing, and science. What was their report? Uh, or something that just came out about Baltimore school district recently. I mean, within the last couple of weeks that said that children there are essentially like they, like there's nobody proficient in math. Like that's ridiculous. But let's talk about all these sexual books and, you know, stuff about Marxist ideology. That's what they need to learn. They, we don't need them to actually do basic things like read or write or know anything about, you know, basic science or math, but we need them to learn about, how communism is great, it's not, and about, uh, you know, 75 gender genders that there supposedly are. There's not. Um, yeah, so we need to get back to kids learning the basics. Cause, I mean, the next generation that comes up, I mean, we've already got, was it millennials are already kind of, they've we've already dropped the ball with them. And was it Gen Z? Is that who's next after them? Um, that at least they seem to be rebounding. But I mean, the kids that are in school now, like my younger nephew, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with them. I mean, we may be looking at an IQ drop into like idiocracy type territory. So <sighs> this really stinks to think about. But anyway, um, sorry to be a downer today. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Please like, share and subscribe. Talk to you soon. Bye.